All right, our next presentation is a really good one. We have a first Canada alum from teams 1360, an Ontario 27 Dean's List finalist, mechanical engineering student at McGill University and co-founder of Acrylic Design and Technology and recently named as a Next 31 2021 founder. That's for like the up, up and coming entrepreneurs across Canada. We have Celeste Nantel. Hi, hi everyone. Hello, Celeste. Hello. How are you doing on this Saturday morning? Oh, good. Uh, you know, I got awoken by Karthik asking me where I was. So um, the best way to wake up. Yeah, um, it's, it's like an in-person event. Exactly. Where, where's exactly. my game announcer? Yeah. You know, like uh, we're starting match number one right now, you know? So yeah, or like uh, we're at 730 uh, meeting uh, and it's like, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, but uh, it uh, got me reminded of the good old days of getting up really early for competitions. Yeah, well, the, you know, there's a lot of good things about these virtual events. Well, obviously we missed our in-person one, but the nice thing about like just having to get up two minutes before the event starts, that's, uh, that's a nice little bonus right there. Um, Celeste, you were gonna talk to us about a very important part of this year's competition. It's about how to give a pitch. So all of our teams, Matt, do you wanna explain the pitch part process of, with the judging? Yeah, so there is, you're going to be spending a total of eight minutes in your judging room. So there's a five minute pitch that you'll be doing with all of your team members and also a three minute question session where the judges will ask some questions. Um, but this pitch is really important because um, it, it plays a qu quite a big part in your rubric itself and in the marking process. So I'm really excited to hear more about what Celeste is like the tips that Celeste is going to give and hopefully um, everyone will know how to structure their pitch and five minutes goes by really fast. So we really fast and the cool thing about the pitch is well first of all your mentor is going to introduce you and they're going to give like a 30 second introduction to like, just like hype you up and tell everyone how awesome you are but then you're going to give this pitch to the judges and Celeste is going to teach you about how to do these pitch but if your pitch is successful you'll get a callback interview and you'll be interviewed again later in the day to figure out who's going to win the prizes and then the three big prize winners best uh best team overall best overall project and best overall pitch are going to be invited to be at part of the FRC Awards Gala on Tuesday night to present live to the entire FIRST community. And that's going to have a massive audience because we're also going to be handing out the Chairman's Awards and Dean's List Awards for the district on Tuesday. So it's really, really big. But that's why we brought a superstar here today. We have Celeste who's going to teach you how to give a pitch. Right, Celeste? Yeah, let's get, let's get into it. Okay, let's do this. All righty. Um, so yeah, let's talk about notes on pitching. I just wanted to uh, say right at the beginning that this is not a pitch um, because I'm going to be breaking a lot of the rules or a lot of the guidelines I'm going to be talking about um, because this is longer than a pitch. Normally a pitch is like three to five minutes and it's really concise. Um, and so you can like do a lot more to like control what you're doing in that three to five minutes. And that's kind of the stuff I'm going to be talking about. But I just wanted to say that this is not a good example of a pitch because that's not what I'm doing. Um, next slide, please. So who am I? Um, I guess I'm gonna start with this because I'm not a pitching expert. I'm a first alumni that has just gone through uh, like some experiences since I graduated and that's how I've picked up a lot of my pitching skills. And so I wanted to share with you some of the like tips and strategies that I find that can really elevate it. So to give a bit of context, um, this is kind of where I've learned it from. So I was an I'm alumni of Team 1360, Orbit Robotics. I was Dean's List finalist in 2017, um, as Karthik said. I did also, while doing STEM, I was in three music th musical theater productions in high school. Um, and that really had me thinking about acting and performance, which uh, I incorporate that in my pitch. And I feel like that's added to um, how I pitch. Um, and uh, now I'm a third year mechanical engineering undergrad at McGill in Montreal. Um, I started out at McGill um, being involved with student government and student councils. Um, so I also kind of learned of how to pitch myself and pitch my, my ideas and my mandates through that. Um, and also was involved with uh, like the Quebec engineering games in which I had the chance to do improv, um, which also I feel like is a really, good skill with pitching is being able to think on your feet and uh, yes and and perform. Um, and that was in French, which was even crazier because it's not my first language. Um, 
and then I, I've done a few internships that were really interesting um, in, for example, in biophysics at a Steinberg Hospital in Toronto. I was doing, um, I was interfacing uh, embedded devices with uh, electric cars at Geotab in Oakville. And last summer I was um, designing like haptic devices. So how you feel things in VR um, at a startup in Montreal. And so that was really, really interesting. And um, last spring, I co-founded with a uh, fellow mechanical engineer at McGill, um, Acrylic Design and Technology, which is an art tech startup building artwork digitization tools and painting automation to allow independent artists to scale their craft, as written. Um, and uh, we've been working on this for the past year, balancing it with school and our um, like own internships that we were doing last summer. And as Karthik said, we we're in the Next36 um, Accelerator and we were chosen for this program beginning of the year and um, we're really excited for the next we've gone a couple of months in the program and now there's some more months to do and it's really going to ramp up and uh, get us all prepped to um, you know pitch a lot more for VCs uh, venture capitalists which is going to be a lot of pitching <laughs> um, and I'm really learning a lot from this experience because I'm kind of going in blind and doing this all for the first time um, and it does feel like a bit like running an FRC team. <laughs> Uh, next slide, please. So where do we use pitching? I really think we use pitching all the time and which is why I think it's a super useful skill. So I mean, in first, if we're speaking directly, uh, chairman's presentations is a pitch, honestly. Um, and uh, talking to pit judges, that's also a pitch. Um, and networking with sponsors, you're pitching your team and you're pitching why sh they should partner with you. Um, in extracurriculars, specifically ones that I did in or that I've a lot of people do in university, um, for example, design teams, you're definitely going to have to pitch your car or your underwater aut autonomous vehicle or whatever you're working on. Um, case competitions are a big thing. Having a startup kind of just feels like I'm still in a case competition like 12 months later. So um, you're always, you're, you really get to work on your pitching skills when you do case competitions, um, when you like present your solution. Hackathons, very similar. Um, like the delegations, um, for, like I'm on the Quebec Engineering Games, uh, dele like the McGill delegation, um, and in student politics, you have to pitch yourself a lot. Um, and also in internships with uh, a lot of, you will have to deal with as you go into university, uh, going into job fairs, every time you approach a recruiter at a booth, you're gonna be pitching yourself in 30 seconds. Um, and interviews, you're, it's like a little pitch, even though there's back and forth, team meetings, you do have, you like as the intern, you do kind of want to prove yourself and prove that you can add value. So performing well at team meetings is advantageous. Um, and so learning how to pitch is can help with that. And uh, very similarly, like design reviews are also kind of a pitch. Um, and in school or specifically for engineering, which I'm in, um, like project presentations, you're pitching there and even talking to profs and administration, like if you're asking for an extension on a deadline or you're trying to get into a class that's full, you're gonna have to pitch why you deserve that and why uh, you should get that accommodation. And um, so you're also using those skills there, even though it doesn't really seem like pitching, using it all the time. Um, so pitching is a performance, um, but it's definitely something that you can all do. Um, and I'm gonna kind of break down some of the like granular details that I've picked up um, that it's like a little bit more effort, but it can really elevate your pitch. and um, take it from something looking kind of amateur to something looking really professional with just a couple like side things. And I'm gonna be going through a bunch of those here. Um, next slide. Um, so, okay, I, the most important part in my opinion for a pitch is establishing the desired narrative. So it's like, what from what lens do I want the audience to view my story? Um, because you can have the control to set that in your pitch and that should be reflected through the slide deck, through the script, through how you answer questions. Um, the narrative should shine through that so that you're able to um, leave the audience with the impression that you want. Like, how do I want my audience to feel after the pitch? You can establish that and you need to strategize to be able to convey that properly. Um, because yeah, the lasting impression is what matters. Um, and also with a narrative, it allows you to set like only one truth that's being shared externally because um, we all know in our, in our FRC teams or in our like robot designs that there's always nuance. It's like, 
oh, the, this works this way, but has issues with this. Um, and it's just nuance doesn't translate very well when you're in a three minute to five minute pitch. Um, it's a lot simpler and like uh, gets to where it gets towards the audience a lot easier when there's one truth um, and like one external narrative about what the team is when or what you're presenting is. When we, in reality, we all know that our, our projects and our teams are complex and layered. Um, and it also having one narrative or um, one truth, it allows for like uh, cohesiveness between multiple presenters. Um, so uh, for example, when I am doing a pitch with my co-founder Chloe, and then we get to the question period and either of us is gonna have to pick up questions, kind of like when judges ask questions and chairmen's, um, we wanna make sure that we're both uh, pursuing the same narrative, that we're both doing the same storyline even though like it's all truth and it's all the um, like the team and what it is, um, but but though um, like you got we it's important to choose ahead of time um, what you want to be saying because if not it can really confuse your audience because they don't have the context to understand the nuances about your team or your project that you do. Uh, next slide. Um, okay, so you want to tether your storyline. Um, and this like very important part of the narrative is you want to be telling a story. You're not just dumping information. You're not just showing something. Um, it's there is got, there's a reason that you're talking about that, and, and that's your story. Um, so what I tend to use is like you like tether your pitch to an empathetic story and something that uh, even as you're presenting information, you can always tie it back to the original storyline. Um, so. For example, a, that could be like a personal experience. Um, like I have a, a, a friend who's a founder um, of a, like a new age toothbrush and how she pitches, she talks about her experience going to the dentist and finding out she has cavities and learning from her dentist that most people actually brush their teeth incorrectly. And that was the inspiration for her startup. But like, that's kind of the story that's like the intro and that, um, familiarizes and conceptual, like really makes it tangible for your audience, what you're talking about. Um, also not like a commonly experienced incident is, can be the storyline that you're tethering your proposition to, your pitch to. Um, like there's a, there's a startup Cheaper Eats um, in the Montreal community and their pitch is awesome because they walk you through um, going into a restaurant, you're eating your meal, you have to pay. And then you're like, you don't want to have to wait for the bill to come to you. And then you sign it and then it goes back and then you're free to go. It's not, a, it's not a frictionless process. And you're able to feel as the audience how you're right, that is not a frictionless process because they walk you through an experience that a lot of us has have gone through and can personally tie in our head what it means. Um, and it it allows them to convey the information of their pitch in a way that really relates more to the audience and that like makes sense because of their pre-existing experiences. Um, or uh, the one that we use as acrylic is the story of imaginary archetypal, archetypal characters. Um, and um, this one is, it's like you still get to have established an empathetic storyline um, because by like establishing names and backgrounds of your characters um, and it, it makes it people first. It's like a people first approach um, and how your, your proposal or your pitch can help um, someone. And so if you're, you're not talking about a personal experience, you're not talking about a commonly experienced incident, then you're able to relate it to these archetypal characters. So at Acrylic, we use Ella and Simon. Um, Ella is the independent artist and Simon is a um, art buyer on a budget. Um, and we talk about our value proposition from their perspectives and how we can help them, even though Ella and Simon are just imaginary and they're just vehicles for us to talk about our, our value proposition. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so embedding re required info into your storyline. Um, this is part of like not dumping your info and having it all look like it's part of the same cohesive story that you're presenting. So um, you don't really want stuff that looks out of place. Um, it should... And that's kind of like how you structure the order um, of your slides and the information you're presenting to make it smooth. Um, and I guess some really like granular things that I've found that can help is when you're dealing with boring information that you need to present, um, you can stick, stick with the user perspective and present it from the user perspective because it makes it more uh, like relatable or, or accessible for the audience to understand. 
So for example, um, talking about the competitive landscape for why your proposition, com what, how your proposition compares to existing things on the market or existing solutions to your problem, it's um, saying the pros and cons from the user perspective, um, relating it to how it, this will be used and how this will impact people. Um, and for example, if you're going through a financial model of your proposition or of your solution, you can walk through an early adopter's typical transaction um, so that it's, it's uh, like it makes sense to the audience and it's not just kind of like numbers and it's not abstract. Um, it's really tangible to a person first experience. Uh, next slide, please. Um, cohesive visual telling, big, big thing. Um, I mean, I have black text on white slides, which is, I guess, cohesive, but you would want to have this a lot more branded on your pitch. Um, and the brand and the vision, like the visuals really set the narrative for visual learners, because someone might not really remember any of what you said during your pitch, but they might remember how your slides looked. And I have a lot of times where I remember how the slides look, but I don't really remember the voice of the presenter or the words they were saying. Um, so the colors and shapes you use really reflect the emotions that the story projects. Um, so like, I mean, I, I guess a, like a, an example is if you were doing like a, a mental health or meditation app, maybe you wouldn't use red as your brown, as your brand color, because it's not a color that that's like calming or, um, reflective. Um, it, it's just red gives a very different emotional response than blue or indigo could. Um, and that does contribute to how your story comes across towards your audience. Um, and also like using visual proofs to support your claims and enrich your story. So I guess um, if you're doing a presentation about uh, like the outreach events your team's done, you would want photos from those events. Um, and even if you're not pointing out the photos during your, during your speaking, just having them up there is like visual, like proof and visual like support towards what you're saying. Um, or for example, like for a startup, it might be like you have a visual proof of, um, like a prototype you might have done. And even if you don't talk about the prototype, just having a photo of it on the screen indicates that um, this is being like worked through and the technical viability is being assessed. Um, and oh, this is very granular, but it does actually make a difference. Um, having brand continuity through inconsistent visuals. So um, the visuals that we use on our acrylic pitch um, to talk about Ella and Simon, are kind of just like open source graphics that we found of uh, human characters, but we wanted to maintain like a consistent narrative um, and like have a consistent story, even though we're using all these different graphics. So um, we uh, like made all of the Ellas have purple hair. And so that's how all of the, the small like girl characters became Ella is because they all have purple hair. Or for Simon, um, they all have a blue beard. And that's how we're able to take all of these like similar looking graphics and have them part of the same story. Um, and I mean, this is really quick, but um, like if you're using graphs and stuff, you can still have that be on brand with your color scheme. Um, and you don't even need to go and fix it, fix your color scheme directly in Excel or wherever you're making your graphs. On Google Drive, you can literally just like tint the, tint the asset and you can change the color of the graph and make it match more with your uh, with your branding. And it's super fast, but it makes a difference for uh, like continuity. Next slide, please. Sorry, next slide. Okay, so your whole pitch is leading up to your ask, your call to action, or your desired takeaway. Um, the story should naturally convince the audience about of the desired takeaway even before you reach it. Um, just because of the story is um, like convincing of what of your narrative. Um, the narrative is kind of like the context which leads to the takeaway. Um, and yeah, the reason is already being narrative. I, I, I narrated as I said on the slide. And it's like the ask how it should be positioned in your storyline. It's like your, um, it's like, oh, we did this. And then this allows us to bring this value to this um, set of people. 
and um, this is how we're doing it so far. This is what we're working on. And it's like, it's the missing piece in the story that you've built is the ask, which is how um, the audience is a part of your story now because you're reaching out to them and you're saying, oh, we need $15,000 or whatever you're asking for, <laughs> or um, we would, love to win the chairman's award um whatever it is um it's like your that's part of um it's part of your story and um it's like it naturally brings the audience uh, into playing a part and helping you complete the story um through you know and that makes them want to do your ask or make them want to internalize the takeaway even if it's just informative um next slide please All right, write a script. Um, I used to not want to write a script and think that I was totally fine and I could do improv and I was fine on my feet. And that might have been the case when I was like peeking at my social interaction in like honestly 2017 when I was doing chairman, sorry, when I was doing Dean's List um, because I had my whole portfolio in my head and I knew how to answer the questions and bring an example in and um, tie it all together. Now I don't talk to other people. I'm in quarantine and I pitch and I even struggle just to answer questions after a pitch. Just um, so I really do recommend writing a script because um, maybe you think that like you're, you can be fine on your feet, but maybe you're having a bad day. Maybe you're tired that day and you don't want that to be reflected in the words and the enthusiasm that you use when you can set that ahead of time in your script. So, I mean, yeah, it ensures you're using the right words. I'm very particular about um, the words that we use to represent acrylic um, because it shapes the external narrative that we're, that we're doing. Um, and uh, yeah, the narrative to be communicated, you can really establish that and make sure it's communicated by writing a script and reading it over and getting it proofread. I mean, like, does this tell the story that I want? Does this communicate the truth that I am sharing externally? Um, and it ensures the flow between the different slides and between different presenters. Um, it can be hard to like hand off presenting when uh, you're doing it with other people in front of other people. Um, but if when it's set in the slides, it's, it's perfect. Um, and it locks in your confident wording ahead of the presentation, which kind of goes with what I was saying earlier, where you might not be feeling it when you're actually presenting it, um, but that shouldn't change the narrative and that shouldn't change the energy that you've chosen. Um, and so you can lock that in by just using those energetic words or using the words that are in line with your narrative in your script. Um, and so you're gonna get that across because it's in the script. Um, and a big thing is it helps you test and maintain uh, time restraint. Yeah, time restraints. All the time um, we write a script and it's a minute over like a three minute pitch, which is a lot of cutting we need to do to get uh, the excess content out. And it's a lot easier to do that when you have a script and you can test it and time it and go again, test it, time it, go again, than just hoping that you're going to be within the three minutes because more than once I've been in situations where they cut you off um, at three minutes, which is really not a good experience. And it doesn't allow you to end your story as you want. It doesn't allow you to get to your takeaway and complete the story with the audience. It's just not, it's not a great way to perform. Um, and this is in like, like in class and schools, they cut you off, which is unfortunate. And also when you're like pitching your startup, for example, they cut you off. So it, it is pretty common. Um, so a script can really fix all these problems, even though I'm like, I don't need to do a script, but it really ensures quality in your presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, iterate your slides. Um, this is, I mean, kind of a no brainer, but um, I like, uh, sometimes I do the slides first and then I make the script. Um, sometimes I, I write a script, I write my story, and then I make slides to match. Either approach is fine, but once you have both, like a, once you have drafts of both, you're going to want to be going between them and iterating because um, you don't want, you want to avoid irrelevant visuals. Um, I used to sometimes just add photos of stuff that was like kind of related to give context. That doesn't fly. Like uh, I wouldn't do that um, now 
or um, you can't get away with it as easily now because all the visuals should directly um, contribute to your narrative and directly contribute to getting your, your audience on board with your ask. Um, and getting rid of redundant text um, is also a big thing. Like there shouldn't really be full sentences unless it's the only sentence on the slide. Um, and uh, also you'll see if you're saying exactly what's on the slide in your script, then you don't need it on the slide. You can say it in the script. And there is something to be said with um, if you have too much text on your visuals, then people are going to be reading your the text on your visuals and not listening to you. Um, and that and the text is up to interpretation from the audience. But the the what you're saying and how you say it, you have a lot more control about uh, with how it's interpreted by the audience when it's actually coming out of your mouth instead of someone reading the text in their head. Um, and yeah, less text is better than more. All that's like always true in my opinion. Um, and you can also like break up your slides to have larger words or larger sentences to have more of an impact and um, get larger visuals. Like if you're squeezing multiple photos in and trying to get them as big as possible to fit around the words, like I have been there, it's time to just take the actual important uh, visuals and give them their own slide. And maybe you flip slides halfway through the the like paragraph or what you're saying or even you duplicate the slide and then you have your large visual between the duplicates so it just looks like you're talking about the things in your slide and then you're showing the large visual that you want and then you're back on the same slide even though it's just like a duplicate um and it's just good for continuity um and uh allows you to kind of talk about a large visual in between in the middle of a slide instead of having to have that at the end of your slide you know maybe that's not the the storyline that you want to go over in that specific slide um let info breeze to the important parts sink in yeah i kind of talked a bit about that uh before like um having like once one big sentence on a slide or like one big factoid on a slide allows it to to breathe and have it more impact on your audience and consistent branding, I guess that's another just like as you're iterating your slides and really cleaning it up, you're going to be you're going to want to look for when your fonts are inconsistent, it's not good. If um, your sizing is inconsistent, uh, it's not good. If you if your um, what do you call it? Your uh, indent is slightly larger on some slides and slightly larger and smaller on other slides. You're going to see that when you click through and it's like although this is little details and i wouldn't sweat it because it is the 20 percent of the of the year and you want to put more of your effort or 80 percent um if you are like really finessing this and really trying to make it perfect those things can make a difference um even just subconsciously subconsciously for your audience uh to see the consistent branding next slide please All right, pitch delivery, um, last and the most important in my opinion. Um, I'd say definitely practice because you don't want to go up there and do your pitch and be like, oh, that wasn't as good as I wanted it to be because that was avoidable. If you um, could, if you practiced it and um, realize that, oh, I don't like the way that this sentence comes out or I don't like the way that we present this slide. This slide might look weak in our narrative. Um, and you're able to figure that all out when you practice more than once, especially with your presenters. Um, don't rush, um, always take your time. And when you're nervous, you're gonna naturally speak faster. I probably have been speaking way too fast this whole presentation. Um, but sometimes I'm doing a three minute pitch and the script barely fits in three minutes. So I will talk very quickly to get through it um is it the best approach no but sometimes you need to if because the script is all together and you're crunched on on time before when you have to present sometimes that happens um and uh sometimes i'm just like okay i'm gonna make this script work but i'm going to have to speak very quickly to get through it and that's just part of it and practicing that can help um okay this is very technical but i actually think it, it makes a difference um, using your chest voice instead of your head voice. Um, so especially um, female identi identifying folk, a, a lot of our voice is coming out of our head and that's where um, the sound is vibrating. This is a bit of like theater, theater technique. Um, 
And uh, because a lot of our vocal range is in our head and it means that the sound that we're doing is a lot more constricted. It's a lot more nasally. Um, it's not as loud. So I'm trying to like put a lot of my voice back up in my head to give an example. Um, while if you're actually transitioning your voice to be a lot more in your chest and it's vibrating in your chest cavity, it's there's a lot more support to your voice. And, um, and also just like, it, especially in male dominant spaces, they're all speaking with their chest voice. Um, it just comes out a lot louder and a lot more confident, honest, honestly. Um, and uh, being able to, I guess, use your chest and use your volume, even if you're staying at the same like loudness, but it's just a fuller sound. Um, it can deliver. It can it can deliver differently when you're when you're pitching. It can it can make you feel a lot more confident a lot take up a lot more space in the room which you want to be doing you do not want to be minim minimizing your the space you're taking in the room um just by changing that and um i guess like specifically if you you all want to try this right now for fun is like switching your breathing from instead of you don't want your shoulders going up and down because that's all tight and it's all up in your neck which is not where you want your voice to be but stomach breathing where your stomach comes out um, allows your voice to go a lot more into your chest and allows, um, yeah, it allows it to like vibrate in this much larger acoustic cavity. Um, stand, that's another thing. I actually don't have a standing setup in my apartment right now, which is unfortunate. And I'm pitching looking down, which also is, isn't great, but some of the best, best pitchers I've seen, pitch, pitchers I've seen in um, COVID times are people that, do it on Zoom while standing up. It's just way more dynamic. You've got a lot more energy and it does help how your how your acoustics are vibrating when you're speaking. It's a lot easier to get it into your chest when you're standing. Okay, engage and report and don't read. Um, even when you're doing, a, when, even when you're following a script and you're reading a script, um, you're gonna wanna make these sentences dynamic. Um, and it's like your report, Recording kind of a bit like a news anchor and engaging with the audience, even if you can't see them, like I can't see any of you. Um, so uh, I, some of the things that I've found to help make it more natural um, is uh, some hand movements, a bit, not too much. Um, it can just give a bit of, uh, especially when we're just a little square on a screen, having a bit of movement can uh, draw eyes towards your screen and make it a bit more engaging. Um, eyebrow raises, head tilts, you're like lean your chest when or stuff like that. That can all just give it a bit more dynamic feel. Smile, I mean that one's really obvious, but um also I fail to do it when I'm presenting. Um, and it can it really can help and especially if you're answering a question you're not sure about. Um, it's like can give you a bit of space to kind of figure out what you want to say. Um, and move your eyes. Um, I sometimes like I have some I struggle with maintaining eye contact when I'm having a conversation with someone sometimes because I'm thinking about how many times I need to blink like blah. Um, but luckily on zoom, it's a bit less direct, but also it can be weird to be staring into a camera the whole time. So I actually look around when I pitch and um, I don't know if that actually makes it a better pitch or if it makes it more uh, distracting for the audience because I'm not always looking at the camera. But for me, at least, it gives me a bit of space to breathe of just kind of what I'm looking at and what I'm thinking at when I'm not always looking at the screen or I'm not always looking at the camera. Um, and uh, like just looking at, uh, to the side for a sec can give my brain a bit of time for the wheels to turn for me to figure out what I'm about to do next. Um, for example, when I'm like answering questions, which I have to think on my feet about, um, I can give you a bit of a, a bit of a breath, a bit of a moment. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so I mean, if you didn't hear any of that, I just the most important thing is that you've got this and that you all have the power to pitch well. Um, and it's just about experimenting, iterating, seeing what takes and getting feedback after your pitch is actually really important. It can be embarrassing to ask for, how did we do after you present? And like, you don't wanna get roasted, but um, honestly getting feedback is the easiest way to make your pitch better over time because you're going to be doing a lot of pitches and some of them are not gonna be good. Some of them are gonna, gonna be better. And you just wanna be collecting that data so that you can get better over time. And it can take years, don't stress about it. You're gonna have lots of opportunities to use this to its full potential.
Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Celeste. Okay, that was uh, amazing. There's a lot of information. I was like taking notes through it. And so I have like things I want to talk about here. And I think it's really important. Um, so number one, we actually have a lot of people with the theater and vocal backgrounds who are participating in the STEMathon today. So I think it was really cool that you showed that your background in those areas are so beneficial for what you do. And like, I remember when you became a game announcer for First Canada, that was one of the things that, you know, when I was talking to you about doing this job, I was like, oh yeah, you're a singer in theater and you're good in front of crowds. But I love the, just the breathing talk. These are things that can be used in so many different ways, right Celeste? Yeah, um, and it, it feels really weird to be rethinking about how I'm breathing, but um, it actually, like I'm like doing it right now, <laughs> uh, it, it can really make a difference for how your sound comes out and also just how your body looks and how it's structured. Um, this, I guess I, I didn't talk about this in my pitch, but what I really find useful is thinking about this bone right here and I wanna turn it up. It's not about like moving your shoulders back, it's just turning this bone upwards, which puts your shoulders back and sets you all up and gets your neck on top of your spine and gets all the voice going where you want it to go. Um, I know that's very granular, but I do find it is helpful. It, it is helpful. It's the, the same old trick, like, you know, use your diaphragm, not your throat, you know, like uh, project, project, project. You talked mm -hmm. about how details matter. And I think this is one that a lot of people miss because a lot of people are like, you know, it's like, oh, I don't need to have, line this up. You know, they don't think that way, but and no one's gonna look at your pitch and be like, oh, it's not lined up. I'm not gonna give them the money, but it subconsciously has an effect. Like when you have random font cha size changes or, mm. you know, like everything's organized, but one thing isn't, or, you know, one bullet point off. Those little details truly do matter. And you obviously have to get the big details solved first, but the little ones matter. So I thought it was a neat connection between your presentation and Lisa's presentation. Lisa's presentation, yeah. you know, a lot of it was focused on answering the question, what's the problem we're trying to solve? You know, and you, when you're designing something, you, it's easy to lose track. And when teams are working on their projects this week, it's going to be this weekend. You know, you have to go back to what's the problem we're trying to solve. And I think with giving a pitch, it's what's the narrative we're trying to send. And that's a really, that's the strategic design of the pitch, right? It's like, you have to identify the narrative that you're trying to get across and make sure everything is supporting that narrative. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Oh. And <laughs> For like, sure. But to me, it's just like that, that comes back to building a robot because when you go, when you're building a robot, if you, for those of you who are involved in first, you're trying to answer the question, how are we going to win the most matches or how are we going to win the turn? And it comes back to that. And so like having this singular point, like to me, like that was such a, so insightful Celeste because I hadn't thought of it like that, but it makes so much sense. Yeah, and like I, you just totally reminded me of uh, 2017, we had a low ball output and spent all this effort and all this like metal and volume in our robot on an indexing system of balls to go into the low, into the low goal, which we used zero times in competition. So it just like wasn't good contribute. It wasn't good like commitment to the narrative and commitment to the actual problem I guess which is get the most points as possible on the field um and um yeah and I I, I like that's that's a, a great um link to R&D because or um to uh brainstorming because it's, it's very easy to get like distracted by um opportunities of cool things to design or cool problems to solve but it's not necessarily the problem that we're trying to solve and that actually gets us points or that actually gets us the next meeting if we're thinking about this and pitching. So a question I have for you, Celeste, uh, when you're giving a pitch, um, do you try and do research on your audience to kind of tailor things to their skill set? I should. And that is the best, that is the best way to do it. Um, I actually like, I mean, I'm going to admit that I lack at that. And sometimes I just go in without knowing and it's, and it's bad and it always doesn't go well because the people ask a question and I'm not sure in what lens to um, use when I answer it because I don't know the pre-existing um, perspective that they have coming in to see my content and see the narrative that I'm that I'm doing. And, and being able to cater your answers to um, what people know and you can find out all that online. You can search up who you're gonna be presenting in front of. Um, it's, it's just like, it's, it's also part of showing you did your homework, which people really appreciate. Um, yeah. 
yeah, I agree. I think there's, yeah. a value, there's a valuable skill here. And like the hack, we talked about this when you were getting ready for one of your scholarship interviews. It's about, mm -hmm. so if you don't know who, who it is and you're, you're going in, you know, without that advanced knowledge, it's reading the room. And this is a really hard skill to develop. You have to do it really quickly because you don't have much time. But reading the rule room based on other cues that you have to try and figure out. And as you're pitching, watch their eyes, see what they're interested in, and then know where to focus on. It's like, oh, I've caught someone's attention here. And it's like, I now have to reel, reel that person in. And so reading the room is a super valuable skill because, you know, when you understand your audience, like one of the big things is, you know, you, Celeste, you talked about, you know, telling the story and walking it through. And when you walk someone through a story, there's two different paths you could take. You can take an emotional path or you can take a numerical path. And different people respond to those things very differently. But some people who like the numerical path do not want to hear the emotional path. And some people who like the emotional path have no interest in the numerical path. But if you can figure that out, oh, you are set. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, like uh, I, just like you said, I, I sometimes I see on Zoom when people react or when they move, when a particular slide is up and I'm like, okay, interesting. I have to figure out why that slide triggered that reaction. Um, and also if it's a good reaction or a bad reaction, like also gives me information about what I need to change or what I need to emphasize more. Um, and also, I guess like sometimes the questions you get at the end of your pitch can be very indicative of where your pitch needs work. Um, because if they're asking questions and you're like, why don't you understand that? It's because you didn't do a good job at communicating it. <laughs> um, um, so, and, and it's always not the audience's fault when they don't get it. It's the presenter's fault for not um, communicating it or catering it for their um, lens. Yeah, that's fabulous. Yeah. Uh, Celeste, we do have to go because everyone's super excited about yep. the theme, but this was a fabulous presentation. Mahak, do you have anything to add for Celeste? Uh, no, I was just gonna thank Celeste for being here. I learned a lot, um, especially about like, using like skills from musicals and theater and how you can incorporate that into your pitch. I think that was super amazing that I've never heard of before. And to all the participants, um, you you can check out the judges on our website um, at firstcanada.org or first can, firstroboticscanada.org slash semathon. Um, and then you can, if, if you wanna do some additional research and really figure out how to read the room, that would be a great way to take all these tips and apply it there. But I'm excited for the theme reveal now. Yeah, and Celeste, thank you so much.